So the land acknowledgement is that we are located on the Huichin, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chacheno speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archeological scholarship that is dis disturbed Ohlone ancestors and made attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archeological inheritance and practice in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all native and indigenous peoples. And with that, I'd like to turn to our guest speaker today, Dr. Ann Austin of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. You can see that up on the screen, I'm assuming it's there. Um, uh, and her uh, talk um, is going to be about her work in um, ancient Egypt. Uh, you can see the title there about it's linked to heterogeneity, frailty, and health. But she has done a range of things. She uh, received her BA from Harvard University, got an MA and PhD in the archaeology program at UCLA, joined, and then joined the University of Missouri St. Louis in 2017 after a two year, a oh, three year, sorry, three year postdoc at Stanford University in the history department. And in her really clever research, she combines um, analysis of, of bones, osteology, and Egyptology to document disease and medicine in the past, studying Egyptian healthcare networks, um, reconstructing them, and figuring out the care networks and the illnesses that were present, especially in the village of Deir el Medina. While working in Egypt, she discovered the only known tattoos, 30 different tattoos, which she has a, put a link to some of those or a link to her work on some of those. I haven't seen it yet uh, in the chat. So if you look in the chat, there should be a link to some of these tattoos, which I wanted to see. Um, uh, and her work in the tattoos and her health work is on uh, really intersects with gender, religion and medicine. So. Uh, in addition to that, obviously, she's uh, involved in uh, collaborative ethnographic research uh, on archaeological field methods uh, uh, internationally. So uh, much, much interesting research is she involved in, and we're really actually grateful and thrilled to have Anne here, obviously, one minute away from Missouri, St. Louis, uh, but here in uh, California and the world. Uh, so we're going to hear her now speak about her research on uh, the hidden heterogeneity in frailty through social determinants of health. So thank you very much, Dr. Austin, for joining us today. Thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm, I'm excited to be here with that, I know, probably a diverse group. Uh, for those of you who are looking at this title and thinking, I don't know what that means at all. I designed this talk uh, to really speak to people who have a background in bioarchaeology, a background in Egyptology, or a background in neither. So I'll be explaining all of this. This is part of um, my current book project that I'm working on. So for those of you who are interested, we were just talking before I started um, about the tattoo work that I'm doing. Uh, I this talk won't be focused on the tattoos, but I actually we have an article that literally just came off the presses a few weeks ago on tattooing that has some of our new discoveries of tattoos. And I put that in the chat for those of you who want kind of the cutting edge tattoo world. And I'd be happy to answer questions about what that looks like. But today, what I want to focus on is the goal of this book project and kind of where it's going. And I would love to get all of your input. Um, and instead of showing you one cohesive chapter, which would probably be a logical talk to give. I want to give you all a sense of uh, how the book operates with pulling data from different sources. So as Christine mentioned, my background is in, in studying human remains in archaeological context and the text. So really bridging bioarchaeology and Egyptology. And that's really my identity as an academic is understanding how those data sets really work together, how we can learn more. So in this talk, I'm going to pull some of the results from different chapters of my book to demonstrate how these two different disciplines can really help inform each other 
and hopefully inform broader conversations in bioarchaeology, Egyptology, and really archaeology more broadly. So in this talk, I'll give you kind of some, I view it as like tapas, like a couple bite-sized pieces from different parts. I'll be showing you evidence from human remains, um, so images and data that I gathered at Daryl Medina from the human remains there, as well as from the, the, the text from this amazing site. And uh, this is going to be, this book is going to be published with Brill through their cultural Culture and History of the Ancient Near East series. So uh, you should be looking forward to that in the 2023, 2024 years. So just to get started with understanding really the title of my talk, uh, in bioarchaeology more broadly, there has been these big conversations around something called the osteological paradox. This is a conversation that started in the 90s with an article by Wood and colleagues where they explored some of the issues that we have when we try to identify health patterns in past populations. And they argue that there are at least three major issues with how we can study health in the past that uh, we really need to address in order to, to talk about health at all. One of the issues they bring up is this concept of hidden heterogeneity and frailty. And what they mean by that is that populations have a lot of underlying differences across people and how likely people are to be sick from a disease. It might be because um, they're exposed to more issues growing up. It might be because they're more likely to get exposed to a pathogen. It might be that they uh, have less access to nutrition. And so this heterogeneity and frailty, these differences across populations and their likelihood to get sick and and experience frailty is hidden in the archaeological record. It's very hard for us to access that. DeWitt and Stojanowski argued that understanding the nature of human frailty and how it relates to social inequality and social complexity is a highly relevant topic that cross cuts disciplinary boundaries. Yet bioarchaeologists have largely, though not entirely, avoided explorations of the topic. So my goal with this book is to explore and kind of tease out, are there ways that we can explain hidden heterogeneity, that we can reveal it to bigger populations? And as I was researching and thinking about how this exists uh, at a more interdisciplinary level to really cross cut those disciplinary boundaries, I focused on conversations around hidden heterogeneity in public health. Modern public health studies, public health researchers, psychology, medicine, all of those fields have at the same time as the osteological paradox developed, grown interest in explaining that same concept of hidden heterogeneity in modern populations. And as researchers explored this, they identified a series of social factors that had really huge impacts on health outcomes and helped to explain the health patterns that we're seeing worldwide. So for example, in this uh, graphic that's based on data from the United States, you can see that access and the quality of healthcare that people have accounts in this graphic for only 20% of the health discrepancies that they see. And instead, the remaining 80% is uh, based on things like your health behaviors, your physical environment, and the socioeconomic factors like education, job status, and family social support. In fact, even those specific things, like your socioeconomic and physical environment, really 50% of our health inequalities can be traced back to our zip codes. So if we want to understand the social determinants of health and how they impact hidden heterogeneity, I think we really should understand it through those social parameters. And yet when I look at big studies of health in the past, a lot of these social determinants seem to be missing in the conversation. So for example, there's a major project called the Global History of Health Project that looks at trends in health and patterns worldwide. They had an initial module that focused just on the Western Hemisphere. They have another one that focused on Europe and they have another one that'll be upcoming that's focusing on Asia. And in each of these, they look at skeletal indicators of stress across a huge number of sites and they compare factors they know for each site. So looking at the initial publication um, that was focused on the Western Hemisphere, they tried to understand how health patterns might be related to different climates, settlement patterns, elevations, the kinds of subsistence plants that people were relying on. And they used these to help us understand more about the ecological and built environments and their impacts on health. 
but relatively less was known about social interactions. In terms of social variables, they were really focused more on things like uh, their estimated social status and degree of social stratification, but couldn't really do much more than that because they were looking at such a large scale. The European module of this project was able to explore it slightly more. They considered how sites might connect to different societal roles. They looked at things like uh, hospital populations or religious uh, institutions. And then they also explored how settlement size might impact health. This may allow us to connect health to other related social determinants like education, yet still many important social determinants remain harder to summarize in such large scale studies including the topic I'll be talking about today, social support and social cohesion. So my book focuses on finding the social determinants of health at Daryl Medina and explaining the health patterns we see at this site through a close analysis of this one village and the ways that I see social determinants affecting health outcomes. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Daryl Medina, this is the site of the workmen who cut and decorated royal tombs in Egypt's New Kingdom period. Um, it is an absolutely exceptional site. If you ever get to Egypt, you have to visit. It's on the west bank of Luxor. And uh, the village of Daryl Medina, you can see in the center of this image. So what's amazing about uh, Daryl Medina is that we actually have a really well-preserved village that can tell us more about daily life. We also have the surrounding tombs that give us a lot of information about uh, the beliefs and practices in this village. And then the most exceptional part of it is this this site right up here called the Great Pit. This was dug in antiquity. It's about 30 meters wide, 50 meters deep, and it was filled with texts that document the kinds of daily life things we might find in our own trash cans. So we have people's love letters, we have their pay stubs, we have um, the receipts from transactions. And these are the kinds of things we can use to really reconstruct these social determinants of health in this village. Simultaneously, with access to the tombs, we have the human remains from the villagers who lived at Daryl Medina. This is one of the tombs that I've worked in. This is the tomb of Ipwi. This gives you a sense of what the tomb looks like today after it had been prepared for visitors um, it, who are in Egypt and wanted to see these different tombs. This is what it looked like when Briere and colleagues visited it. And as you can see, the tomb was originally filled with human remains that had been heavily looted. These re human remains are uh, from individuals who were looted even back in antiquity. So we have tomb robbing papyri that date back to the use of the site. And because of just the, the way that they had been treated for so long, they were left unstudied until I started working at Daryl Medina in 2012. So today's focus is going to look at evidence of physiological stress, um, particularly from crania, and then I'll also show ephemera and tibiae that come from three tombs, TT 217, 290, and 298. And these represent really the span of the occupation of the village. So they give us a good sense of what we see across the several hundred years that the village was occupied. Additionally, I'm gonna pull from some of the Ramesid texts from the site that talk about this concept of social support. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. And as I mentioned, I wanna give you kind of some bite-sized pieces. So what I'm gonna do is give you two bite-sized pieces from an osteological standpoint um, to give us kind of a reference point about how health outcomes look in this village. And the first one I wanna show you are the enamel hypoplasias at the site. Now enamel hypoplasias develop soon after birth to around ages six or seven in permanent dentition. And they're a physiological stress response where your body has so only so much energy that it can use to produce enamel. Enamel is the hardest substance in the body, so it really does take quite a lot to make it. So if you're experiencing a stressor, which could be any kind of stressor, actually, it does not just have to be something like disease. It could also be malnutrition or even psychological stressors. Those can impact enamel production. And what we see is that when the body doesn't produce enamel, the rest of the tooth can grow, and it leaves these uh, characteristic marks in the teeth where the enamel isn't present. Their score is present whenever I saw them macroscopically, if I could feel them with a fingernail. And while these often take in a linear appearance, they can also form as pits or grooves. So you can see in this slide, the presence of pitting in a kind of straight line along this canine. And you can see there's also multiple enamel hypoplasias for this individual. 
looking at the data from Daryl Medina, I had about 113 maxillary mandibles that I could study, but only 90 of them were observable for enamel hypoplasias, meaning there is at least one tooth present that had more than half the crown. And if we look at just the raw numbers, we have um, them present in about 26% of canines. It's, that's the tooth that tends to show them the most because it takes the longest to develop in the mouth. And all teeth rate 7%. If I looked at elements and I looked at, uh, you know, just a mandible or maxilla, if any of the teeth show it, 29% of all elements had at least one enamel hypoplasia present um, if there were canines and incisors. If I looked across all elements, that number goes down to 13%. We can also look at these as are distributed by estimated sex. And when we do that, you can see that there's actually not a big difference in the proportion of individuals that have enamel hypoplasias across those estimated to be male versus female. If I looked at the number of teeth, I have a kind of large number of teeth, but those are predominantly pushed by these two women that I found in, uh, in TT217. These two women date to the 18th dynasty. I have Hemen here. She was found actually originally in her coffin. She was removed from her coffin by the original excavators. So we know her name. We know her context. And what's interesting is she is one of the earliest individuals we have at this site. And she dates to just after the Amarna occupation. So those of you with an Egyptology background will know that this is a kind of unusual time in Egyptian history and a time where we see skeletally people have a lot of stress that are living in Amarna. And interestingly, these two women have the most evidence for enamel hypoplasias of anyone at the site. Um, so I think that connection is just a small sample size, but it's an interesting one to see. We could also look at this by age group, and you can see that um, there aren't a huge number of enamel hypoplasias in individuals that are under 20 or those over 50. But I'll point out that there, this might be due to sample bias. We have really big issues just having uh, incisors and canines that are observable in older individuals because they tend to lose their teeth before they um, before death, so we don't have those teeth present, or their teeth are so ground down that there's not much of the crown left to observe. And those that are under 20, we have a couple examples, but particularly for younger individuals, we might not have a, a permanent dentition in yet, and um, their dentition was more likely to fall out post-mortem. So those are two issues with those data sets. It's interesting to see that we have kind of the most in our 20 to 35 age group, but because these are smaller, I'm presenting them and um, we're gonna kind of wait and see with, with more evidence from Daryl Medina if there is indeed an age trend. Comparing these to other sites in Egypt, you can see that Daryl Medina per individual and per canine has the lowest rate of enamel hypoplasias of any other site that's reported uh, that I have evidence from. And this includes sites from individuals that are in working populations, like the working cemeteries at Amarna. It includes elite populations, like the Giza high officials. It even includes other comparable populations that are kind of in a middle socioeconomic class, like Tombos. If I look at even a broader context, like the Global History of Health Project, you can see that the rate at Daryl Medina um, based on canines is much, you know, really in the top third of sites that they're looking at. So this suggests that childhood health has less stress at Daryl Medina than many other places. We can also look at stature. This is my second bite. And this is looking at uh, adolescent health. So it's really much more reflective of what's happening in late childhood and early, early adolescence. Because as you grow, if you have some kind of health interruption in your early childhood, you can catch up for that growth. So we're really thinking here more about those teenage years and the health impacts there. Now, stature can be impacted both by genetic potential and your stress response. So I'm five foot two, I'm relatively short, but it's more because my parents are both relatively short individuals. My genetic potential for height was only gonna get so far. Uh, so when we're looking at this, it's hard to compare really diverse populations. But one way that we can compare them is looking at how many individuals fall outside the mean um, that are more than two standard deviations away, because that'll give us some information about people who've had stunted growth. We can also look at it by comparing how much variation do we see in stature in populations. 
I measure stature at the maximum length of the femur and tibia, and I estimate maximum stature from regression equations uh, from ancient Egyptian populations. The data you see right here in this slide show that, you know, unexpectedly, if we look at estimated sex, males have a higher average stature than females. But what I'm interested in this is really the distribution. And you can see there's a pretty normal distribution for these two groups, but there's much less variation for females at this site. And if we look at those potential examples of stunted growth, we only have two males out of 84 and one female out of 65 that fell more than two standard deviations below the mean. Putting this in context with other sites in Egypt, that dotted line in each of these graphs shows the mean at Dar al Medina in comparison to the means of other populations. And uh, as you can see, particularly for males, they're not, their stature is not as tall as kings or these really high elites, but they are taller than workmen at other sites, uh, than non-working populations at other sites as well. And we see something similar for the women at Daryl Medina. They are slightly shorter than or comparable in size to um, women at Amarna. But they seem to be taller than than the North Tomb Cemetery at Amarna, where we see really just severe health issues, and at the site of Tombos and among Giza work, workers. So both of these data sets give us a sense that um, overall, men and women at Dar Medina are experiencing less stress during that adolescent period as well. More broadly, as I mentioned, we could explain the differences not just through the means, but also through the amount of variation we see. And if I look at the standard error for females at Daryl Medina and males at Daryl Medina, and I compare them to the broader Global History of Health Project and the European module, this green dot is where we see our data showing up for Daryl Medina. So they have the lowest rates of standard error for females and one of the lowest kind of, you know, within the lowest third for males. These point to the idea that really we're seeing less stress during childhood and adolescence at Daryl Medina. So with that, I want to turn the talk into thinking about why. How do we explain the presence of uh, really less stress at this site? And what does that tell us um, about about how social actions might impact health outcomes. Now, I actually look at this through many different social determinants, but today, just to give you our, our bite-sized piece, I'm going to focus on this concept of social cohesion and social support. This social determinant of health was one that researchers started studying really early on in a way to explain the connection between stress and the myriad ways our families, partners, and friends take care of us. One way that this has been summarized is through social support as the provision of assistance or comfort to others, typically to help them cope with biological, psychological, and social stressors. And within conversations around social support, researchers have focused on this idea of social cohesion, which describes the sense of connectedness and solidarity within a group. One way social cohesion is more clearly defined is as the absence of latent social conflict, whether in the form of income or wealth inequality, racial or ethnic tensions, disparities in political participation, or other forms of polarization, and the presence of strong social bonds, measured by levels of trust and norms of reciprocity. In modern populations, when researchers focus on this concept of social support and social cohesion, they find that these can impact health through buffering stress. So I have a great example, just personally, I'm gonna have surgery in a couple of weeks and we already have a whole meal train planned with friends, family, neighbors, bringing food to our house to make sure that um, while I'm going through that period of physiological stress, I have the food and provisions that I need. We also see social support impacting health by creating conditions to prevent encountering stressors at all. In modern populations, an example of this could be uh, smoking. We saw that smoking, we all know smoking is deleterious to health. And when groups of individuals try to quit smoking together, they're more likely to be able to quit than they try to do it alone. Or alternatively, groups of individuals uh, who don't smoke are, you know, an individual is less likely to be a smoker if their peers are not smokers. So they might even prevent them from encountering that stressor really at all. And then another way is to offer a direct benefit to health regardless of stressors. So there's really interesting work that looks at even the, the idea of getting support can sometimes have positive health outcomes. So researchers uh, looked at um, 
how much people would anticipate they would get in terms of support from family or loved ones and to, to really quantify what that looks like. And then they looked at, at the resulting health outcomes for that population over a period of time and found that the people who anticipated more support, regardless of whether or not they got it, had improved health outcomes. So this idea of social support, I think it's something that uh, I think it offers a really specific way that we can think about stress mediation through social mechanisms. And I explored this in a chapter that looks at all the evidence I can find for social support from Daryl Medina. But to get a little small bite, I'm gonna show you one set of documents. And this is the Will of Nakti. Now, uh, the Will of Nakti is really like one of my favorite documents from this site. It is, a, as you can see, it's this beautiful, huge papyrus. Uh, now, Nakti herself is an interesting character. So she was married to the the senior scribe in the village, who's the most senior person in the entire village. He himself was also, he was adopted by the previous senior scribe and um, the previous senior scribe had no other children. So the Kenner Hopeshev, her first husband, inherited the wealth from his father. She then inherited Kenner Hopeshev's uh, wealth because uh, he was much older than her when they were married. In fact, Egyptologists aren't even sure about the nature of their relationship. They themselves, the two of them, didn't have any children, but she remarried and her second husband, she had at least eight adult children with him. So uh, this will is where she is distributing all this property that she's inherited and saying which of her children will receive her property. And the will is interesting because it contains an addendum written within a year of the original will itself. And in that addendum, we learn a little bit more about the dynamics of what's going on. Um, there is a, a son that gets written out of the will and he challenges the will. So the addendum is, is addressing that challenge. We also have this legal transfer of a washbowl to her son, also named Kenner Hobeshev after her first husband. And this one is interesting because it predates the will by just a few weeks. And in this legal transfer, she uh, has her son promise to provide for his father and in exchange, she'll give him this, this washbowl. And then we have two documents that are the property distributions after her death. So her death actually occurs within a year of the will being written. And these two property distributions tell us about whether or not her will is actually kept to her wishes or if people actually act against her wishes. So let's look at what she says. In her will, she writes, as for me, I am a free woman of the land of Pharaoh. I brought up these eight servants of yours and gave them an outfit of everything such as usually made for those in their station. But see, I am grown old and see, they are not looking after me in my turn. Whoever of them has aided me to him, I will give of my property. But he who has not given to me, I will to him, I will not give my property. She then goes to completely write out three of her children, Neferkhotep, her son, Chenu, a daughter, and Chata Nebu, another daughter. And when we look at those property distribution lists, like the one you see here on the left, they're not, their names are not in sight. So they were clearly not given the property. This like they followed through with the will. Neferhotep disputes the will. Um, and it's interesting because if you look at what's written in the will, she even explains in detail in the will that she's not giving property to him because she has already given too much to him in his adulthood to take care of him. And so all the things she's given over the years to him count as his property and he's not gonna get any more. When he goes to dispute the will, he's rebuked. He's told that if he ever tries to dispute it again, he will receive 100 lashes. Uh, so clearly this will is upheld. It's, it's really something that the legal system is recognizing. And what I see in this, when I'm thinking about it in terms of social support, are these clear strategies that Nilnakti is using to secure social support? So first of all, in her text, she really has these appeals based on familial relationships. This idea that she as their mother took care of them and so it is their role as her children to take care of her. She sets up um, having her husband secured after her own death by ensuring that Ken or Hobeshev takes care of his father through the exchange of the wash basin. And this could have been necessary if the couple relied in some part on her wealth, since she inherited from her first husband and the inheritance rules in Egypt then would pace it to her children, not to her second husband. 
Second, when she removes her four children from the will, she makes it clear that this is because they were not reciprocating care in her old age. We see this much more broadly in Egyptian uh, legal texts as this kind of concept, this principle of reciprocity. And it's a legal principle that demonstrates that the concept of reciprocal care was a widely held belief that carried with it legal weight. She emphasizes this further by elucidating all the objects she'd given to Neferhotep to continue to take care of him into adulthood, really quantifying her social support. I'd also like to mention that she writes this will in the presence of 14 witnesses. That is a huge and unusually high number. And these individuals included the most senior members of the community, like the village scribes, foremen, and draftmen. By publicly calling out those members of her family who were negligent and by rewarding those who took care of her, Nanakti uses her notable position in the community and her inherited wealth to really coerce her children into providing her social support. When I take this and I put it in the broader context of texts that I'm seeing from Daryl Medina, including legal records, personal letters, and wisdom literature, I see these same concepts repeating again and again. So when I look at personal letters for examples of uh, care across individuals, I don't see care as having a trend based on gender or generation. Instead, anyone who's giving care to another person, I see this kind of line back. So brothers care for sisters, husbands care for wives, and vice versa. I also see that uh, in the wisdom literature from the site, there is an emphasis on neighborly care and this kind of association of people who know each other needing to take care of each other. So there are texts that are part of this big genre of wisdom literature, you pass down wisdom from father to son. It's something that exists throughout Egyptian history. And at Daryl Medina, some of those texts are authored specifically by the workmen in that village. And when I look at the changes they made, they added in ways to be a good neighbor. I also see in the legal records this broader concept of reciprocation and that just really being repeated in the site. And when I look across all those documents, what I see is that general caretaking, provisioning of food, clothing, labor, shelter, and medicine, and giving property are all forms of social support that are documented um, throughout the village. So bringing this together to think about what makes Daryl Medina potentially different is this idea of social cohesion. Now, this site has really strict boundaries and unambiguous membership. So when they call on neighborly uh, care and support, this really calls on anyone who is part of this village. Because the workmen who cut the tombs uh, needed to live near the tombs, the village is separated from other parts of Egyptian culture. So the boundaries and the definitions of who's in and who's out are really clearly known. These individuals also have comparable social status. Um, while there might be some hierarchies within the village, they all come from a fairly similar socioeconomic background. And there's clear norms of reciprocity that are acted out in this village and even probably uh, emphasized beyond what I'm seeing in other Egyptian sites. We can see in this text that local legal enforcement of social norms is one way that this kind of concept of social support and social cohesion is really emphasized here as well. So when I think about what makes Daryl Medina potentially different, what might heighten what Daryl Medina looks like when compared to other sites, what I see is that social cohesion at Daryl Medina in combination with inherited family wealth would have improved the villagers' health by stabilizing their access to food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. As people aged, they were buffered from occupational stress by having a means to retire, to live in their children's household, to get extra support from their adult children. They may have even benefited from the indirect way social support operates by feeling more confident support would be available in the future because of this communal emphasis on social support through feasting, the legal system, and wisdom texts. These factors translate to ways a community like Daryl Medina could have better health outcomes than communities in short-term state building efforts, like those buried at the North Cemetery at Amarna, or the workers buried in Giza, or even the relatively middle class individuals buried at Tombos. In these shorter term settlements where many residents may have been separated from their families, there was little opportunity for the community to generate intergenerational wealth and insufficient time to create a strong sense of social cohesion. Even if these communities shared similar values like an emphasis on reciprocity, they may not have had the material wealth to enact the substantial social support they needed.
Just want to say thank you for attending. And uh, this research wouldn't have been possible without support from the Institut Francais d'Archéologie Orientale, with whom I do my research in Egypt, the American Research Center in Egypt, the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, and then funding and support from Stanford University and the University of Missouri. Thank you. I unmuted myself. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, I think everybody's muted who are here. Some people are clapping, um, <laughs> um, little hand claps by their names. That's good. So um, now, uh, if you have some time, we, we have a few minutes left, about 10, where we can ask questions. People can ask questions. And I suppose either you can um, unmute yourself or put something in the chat. I think those are two options. Um, Nico, there may be more, um, but those are the two that I'm thinking of. So um, <clears throat> I would like to start out by asking, uh, first of all, that was really fascinating and so sort of socially sensitive and anthropological. I really appreciate you going from texts and bones to to humanity. So uh, I hope every student got to, every student in our group got to watch that because it's really <laughs> a great example of that. But I wanted to ask, um, you obviously do dove into this woman's life and I kind of feel like that myself right now with my family. So well done her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm gonna take uh, some leaves from her her, her work. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm assuming in this pit of gold, <laughs> golden text that you all found, um, that that there were other settings that were obviously not going to be as sensitive, or you you wouldn't have such a, a rich data. But are there other examples of this sort of human, very modern in a way engagement with family? I mean, is this is this an outliner yeah. of this particularly woman's place, or is this really kind of how everybody you think was enacting there? And that. And I'll let other people hopefully come in with questions. Thank you. Yeah. So if I, you know, for the full chapter, I go into other examples, but I'll just say, she, I don't think she's an outlier in terms of um, her expectations for social support and the ways that she talks about family and the role of family. So I've got, for instance, this one really fantastic text. Uh, it's a woman writing to her sister, complaining about this woman's, her husband, and she's like, you know, my husband has been yelling at me constantly because you all aren't providing us with fish and bread daily as everyone else is doing. So it's really clear, A, what the norm is, right? The norm is that siblings support each other. And B, that she's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because she is frustrated with her husband, appealing to her sister for support. So this is just one other example. We have tons. What makes Neil Nakati interesting is that she has that intergenerational wealth to get it done, right? Like she has the resources. So when I think about how social support can operate differently across populations or across individuals and that concept of hidden heterogeneity and how it fits to that, that's where I see how it's working. And what I like about that is that it's not just health equals wealth, which is a, cor a correlation, but it doesn't explain causation. Instead, it really shows like one example of how causation happens in this person's life in terms of getting the support, not only she needs, but her husband, her children, um, et cetera. Yeah, it's so wonderful and, and rich. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Chris Hoffman, which I'm gonna read out. Um, he says, thank you. Do you think you have the same populations represented by the osteological and text data sets, not in terms of specific individuals, but some basic categories? Who might the missing from one kind of information or another? Oh, sorry, who might be missing from one kind of information or the other? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so in, the, in terms of the osteological data sets, one thing that's really fortunate for us is that for most of the occupation of Daryl Medina, they have family burials. So everybody, and this is what I've seen in terms of the bioarchaeology, everybody from very, you know, infants to the eldest people in the village are well past 50. Uh, and at that point, osteologically, it makes it hard to even estimate age. They're all in the same tomb. So I think that is helpful. 
um, looking at their demographics, they seem representative. In the earliest period of the occupation of the site, the children were buried separately. And then there were smaller tombs that weren't the full family. They were just a couple individuals. So I have burials uh, from that site, but luckily from that period, I have burials of adult men and women as well as some of those children. So it's a much smaller data set, but similarly diverse in terms of age. What might be missing uh, in skeletally are people who didn't get to be buried within the village. So this village, it's, sole purpose is to cut and decorate the royal tombs. And as men grew into adulthood, they were there was a competition over who got the job that their father had, because usually there's more than one adult male. Uh, so some of them might have stayed in the village, some of them might have left. And so within the village, you might see, for instance, like there's less um, consistency with men staying in the village than women. If I look at the text, that's where I really feel like the bioarchaeology is giving us a picture we didn't have before. So our texts from this village are predominantly from the working men in the village. They predominantly talk about the experiences of those working men because many of the texts are designed for the state. They're documenting if they went to work, what day they went to work, why they were sick, how many wicks they used, you know, these, these details of bureaucracy. And so children, the elderly, women are missing from these texts. This is where the tattoo research comes back in because we have a couple depictions of possible tattoos from Daryl Medina, but it was really a practice we didn't know a lot about uh, because they're not mentioned at all in any of these thousands of texts we have from the village. And as I've done more and more research, we see that they're actually something that might have been more common than we realize on women and definitely something that was you know, widely understood. We, we're finding it frequently enough that it was not something that was rare. So I think that tells us a little bit about how biased our textual record really is. Well, thank you. I mean, Chris, uh, Chris says thank you too. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to, um, as we wait for other questions, we have really just a very few minutes left, but um, you presented a figure of a kind of about us today in terms of healthcare versus health behaviors versus physical mm -hmm. environment versus socioeconomic, sort of a little being, and that 50% was zip code, you, you said, mm -hmm. which was home, right? And so can you say something about their zip code? Because uh, you're making a case for them being pretty good. I mean, them being pretty healthy, mm -hmm. them being pretty tall, you know, the, sort of the data you have on the osteological side. Are you making a case that these folks are have a pr yeah. pretty good zip code, if you will, yeah. uh, in the greater Egyptian um you know, I don't know if they're not, they're not slaves, but they're working for the state. I, you know, assume right. the whole lives, the whole family, the whole world is working for the Pharaoh. So, so where do they fit in? Yeah. So they have a really unique zip code. Uh, we, if I tried to use our ways of describing it, like white collar, or blue collar, they don't quite fit because the manual work of building, of, they're cutting limestone cliffs. So they're really digging deep into limestone. It is hard manual work, work to cut these stone tombs. And they are expected to keep a good pace of doing it because uh, the king wants to see progress. So they are being monitored very closely in their progress. So in that sense, they're a blue collar workforce. On the other hand, they are highly skilled and their knowledge is really prized. They're highly literate. They are paid every very consistently by the state. And when they stopped being paid, they went on strike. So they are, you know, they know their own power. They know they're not going to get replaced. They know that they have, um, you know, unique skill set and ability that is prized by the Egyptian state. And because of that, this village that is built just for this purpose, uh, they get a lot of amenities. So they don't live near the Nile, which is on itself, on its own, a negative, but they have water carriers bring water to the site. They have uh, wood carriers bringing wood to the site. So they have fuel that they can use. They've got like a lot of extra resources that are provided to them. So when I think about the broad, bigger picture that I'm seeing in health outcomes, what's interesting is they kind of get the best of both worlds. They have that socioeconomic power from their intergenerational wealth that I was describing, but they also get power from all of the consistency they get from the state. 
So they're really getting like, these two benefits side by side, whereas most populations that we're looking at in Egypt, if I look at other zip codes, it's one or the other. Interesting, right. So they're specialists, as we might call them in archaeology. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In a special, unique place. So um, I don't want to keep asking questions because that's not very safe, fair. <laughs> so I can't tell, Nico, if you can help, if there's any questions elsewhere that are lurking. Um, we we do have to stop soon, Nico. I don't see any questions in the I, chat. I'm looking in the chat too, but mm -hmm. is there anything anywhere else? Anyway, okay. okay. Um, so um, I guess we will... I, I might ask... Um... Please. Have you pursued gen genetics relatedness in, in your work, or is there any potential for? We, it's you know? hard. We won't be able to do uh, DNA because we can't export samples. So one possibility that I'd like to explore in the future, we are, we're kind of just getting to the point where it's where we can start doing this, is looking at the different tombs where we're working and seeing if you can see uh, differences in how in biological distance within and between these tombs. So right now I've got three tombs that occupy kind of different periods of the site. Um, there are more tombs that we plan to work in in the future. And so as we get more data from these other tombs, my hope is that we can start to build and see, do we have kind of distinct family lineages that we can actually identify based on measurements and observations in the skeleton? Yes. That's great. I um have a former student, um, Amr um, Sahat, who worked, I think, at that site too on the archaeobotany, and uh, so I I have some some connection with it at a distance. But it did always sound extremely complicated and fascinating. So what a wonderful place to be uh, diving into the society um, that is a rich and long lived one. So. Um, this is Zoom and we're a little out of touch with that, but I want to thank you across the, the miles that we are uh, for your time here and your presentation. Really wonderful. And um, I see someone saying wonderful research, very interesting approach and exciting to oh, be able to use okay. text about individuals alongside skeletal data. So um, I don't know if you can see this too, but I'm saying it out loud just in case people can't see it. So. Um, yes, thank you very much. And this is the sound of one person. <laughs> <laughs> thank I don't you. I don't know how else to do this anymore, but I will clap for you. Thank you so much, Anne. Really a pleasure.